Daniel 1 through 28. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be throughout the whole kingdom, and over them three high officials, of whom Daniel was one, to whom these satraps should give account so that the king might suffer no loss. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Then these high officials and satraps came by agreement to the king and said to him, O King Darius, live forever. All the high officials of the kingdom, the prefects and the satraps, the counselors and the governors are agreed that the king should establish an ordinance and enforce an injunction that whoever makes petition to any god or man for 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Therefore, King Darius signed the document and injunction. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as he had done previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and plea before his God. Then they came near and said before the king concerning the injunction, O king, did you not sign an injunction that anyone who makes petition to any god or man within 30 days except to you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The things stand fast according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which cannot be revoked. Then they answered and said before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was much distressed and set his mind to deliver Daniel. And he labored till the sun went down to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and the Persians that no injunction or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. Then the king commanded, and Daniel was brought and cast into the den of lions. The king declared to Daniel, May your God, who you serve continually, deliver you. And a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet and with the signet of his lords, that nothing might be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No diversions were brought to him, and sleep fled from him. Then, at break of day, the king arose and went in haste to the den of lions. As he came near the den where Daniel was, he cried out in a tone of anguish. The king declared to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lions' mouths, and they have not harmed me because I was found blameless before him, and also before you. O king, I have done no harm. Then the king was exceedingly glad and commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no kind of harm was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. And the king commanded, and those men who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and cast into the den of lions, they, their children, and their wives. And before they reached the bottom of the den, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces. 
Then King Darius wrote to all the peoples, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in all my royal dominion, people are to tremble in fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God, enduring forever. His kingdom shall never be destroyed, and his dominion shall be to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. He who has saved Daniel from the power of the lions. So this Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. What a story. Welcome to the weekly gathering of Christ Community Chapel. My name is Zach. I'm one of the pastors here. And I'm very glad you're here with us this weekend, whether you're here in the West service, you're over in the East service, or you're watching online, thanks for being with us this weekend. I can't wait to dive into that story. It's an amazing, amazing story. But before I do that, you know, the last few weeks I've been telling you about an event that's coming up we're calling Considering Jesus. I'm very excited about this opportunity for you to grow, for you to bring a friend who maybe doesn't know Jesus and for them to explore Christianity at this event as we talk about how the gospel of Jesus can help us to navigate this polarized world. I thought you might be tired of me inviting you to this event, so I actually reached out to Scott Sauls, who's speaking at the event, and asked him to invite you. So check out the screen. This is Scott Sauls inviting you to Considering Jesus on August 11th. Hello, friends from Northeast Ohio. My name is Scott Sauls, and I'm looking very much forward to joining you for the Considering Jesus event coming up in Hudson, Ohio on August the 11th at Christ Community Chapel. We're going to be uh, talking in this conference that is for those who are unsure about Christianity as well as uh, those who are Christians or who would identify as Christians. Uh, We're gonna be talking together about the polarized climate that we're in. Uh, We're going to engage with how fatigued so many of us are with us against them culture and uh, perhaps uh, think as well about what a better way forward might look like for us in days and years to come. Again, so looking forward to being with you, and uh, we'll see you soon. Well, as you can tell, Scott is just the nicest guy in the world. Uh, He's the absolute right guy to be talking about this topic to us. We are so excited uh, for this event that uh, in addition to telling you about it every week, we've also put together something we're calling invite kits. You can actually pick one up in the Next Steps area. And in the first initial invite kits that go out are a couple of things. Uh, The the book, A Gentle Answer by Scott Sauls, that's our gift to you. Uh, A pamphlet that can help walk you through how to go about inviting uh, a friend to this event. And also a gift certificate or gift card to a local area restaurant. Uh, Here's the idea. We want you to pick up a packet, bring a friend, come to the event, and then go to dinner afterwards and to talk to your friend about what they heard and see what the Lord does. Now, as you might imagine, supplies are limited. So following the service, you're going to want to go to the Next Steps area and grab one of those invite kits while they last. The only thing I ask is if you take one, you are committing. Hey, I'm going to bring a friend. I'm I'm not going to take my wife out to dinner on the church. I'm going to bring a friend. And we just really think God is going to do some amazing things. August 11th, considering Jesus, do not miss that event. I'm super, super excited about it. But I have to be honest, not nearly as excited as I am to dive into Daniel and the lion's den this morning. So if you have a Bible, would you take it out and open it to Daniel chapter 6, the book of Daniel chapter 6. If you do not have a Bible, then I would love for you to fire up your phone and scroll uh, to the Bible app or whatever you you use on your digital device and open it to Daniel chapter 6. As you do that, let me hold out to you the outline I'm going to use to help us navigate this passage Three simple points, and they go like this. I want to talk about what is faith, why does it matter, and how does it grow? Okay, what is faith, why does it matter, and how does it grow? All right, as you open Daniel 6, let's start with the first one. What is faith? You know, this is a very famous story. If you have grown up in church, been around the church for any length of time, you are probably familiar with this story. If you're doing the Jesus Storybook Bible, challenge. You've read about this story. This is a well-known, famous story, and for good reason. It's exciting. It has some plot twists. There's political intrigue. There's a lot happening in this story. Most of us are familiar with it. 
It's also a famous story about faith. It's pretty easy to see when you read it that it is a story about faith. Daniel has faith, faith to even take him in and out of the lion's den. And faith is a pretty familiar concept. That's a word that we use all the time. You have faith, I have faith, you have faith, we all have faith. But you know, sometimes when a story is really famous, we can think we know it so well, we actually miss what it's really telling us. And sometimes when a word is used so often, uh, it ceases to really mean anything. When you say faith, you mean one thing, and when I say faith, I mean another. So it's probably right to just slow down and say, wait a minute, what's going on in this story, and what does it mean that this is a story about faith? I wonder what you think of when you think of the word faith. In, in my experience, there tend to be two primary views of what that word means, and you might find yourself resonating with one of these views, or you might find yourself somewhere in between. The first is what I'll call the secular view, which is to say that in this view, faith really means something you believe, but you cannot know. Something you believe, but you can't know. You can't prove it. It's, it's like saying there's knowledge, things we study, things we learn, things we observe, things we can quantify, and then there's faith. And faith is just things you believe. You, you can't prove them, you can't know them, you just believe them. That is one way of thinking about faith. That might be what you think of when you think of the word faith. There's another view, which I'll call the religious view, which is to say that what faith really means is to kind of ascribe to a higher concept or a higher set of principles. So you say things like, I have faith in God. I have faith in this religion, in this book, in this, in this prophet. I believe this set of ideals, these principles, this creed. It, it doesn't necessarily have much to do with my day-to-day -day life. It's just something I have chosen to believe in. Those tend to be the two dominant views of faith in our culture. But the first thing I want you to see is that if you bring either one of those concepts of faith to this story, you are going to miss what this story is all about. Because it is neither one of those views that Daniel displays when it comes to faith. To say that Daniel is a man of faith is neither to say that he's a man who just believes things that he can't know, or that he's a man who ascribes to a set of high ideals that have no day-to-day -day bearing on his life. Instead, when Daniel displays faith, here's the faith he shows us. It's simply this. For Daniel, faith is simply trusting God. That's it. It's trusting God, trusting that God will do what he says he's going to do, trusting that God is good. Faith simply means trusting God. Now, you see that in a lot of ways in this story. And by the way, you see it long before Daniel ends up having a scary sleepover with lions, as the Jesus Storybook Bible will say. For example, the first way you see Daniel's faith in God, his trust in God, is in his practical obedience, in the story, Daniel is rising up the political ladder, and as you might uh, be familiar with in our own culture or from the Netflix series you're binging right now, there are people who do not want him to rise. So they begin to maneuver, and they're looking for a way to bring Daniel down. In our day, you might say they're doing opposition research. They're looking for some flaw in his character that they can leak to the media or tweet about or use to blackmail him. And the thing is, they can't find anything. And in verse 5, look at what they say about Daniel. This is a hilarious way to say that Daniel is practically obedient to God. Verse 5, then these men said, we shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. In other words, they say Daniel is so practically obedient to God that the only way to get him in trouble would be to make obedience to God illegal. Now, that is quite a statement about Daniel's character. Daniel is a man for whom faith means trusting God in every area of his life. Daniel thinks about money the way God says he should. He thinks about family or career or sex the way in which God thinks he should. He is practically obedient to God. 
Now let me ask you, why would a person build a life of practical obedience to God? Why would a person handle their money or their family or their career or whatever it might be? Why would they do it God's way? Well, you might say, well, because they're very moral or because they're very religious. And yet there are quite a few religious and moral people here in the room who would tell you we are not practically obedient in every way. Now, the only way that you could have this level of practical obedience is if you actually trusted that God's way in whatever category of life you're thinking about is actually best. Daniel really believes that living life God's way is the smartest and wisest way to go. And he believes that because he trusts God. This is like going to a financial planner and the financial planner saying to you, hey, if you want to be where you want to be 10 years from now, you need to invest your money this way. You need to spend it this way. You need to say no to these things and yes to these things. Well, if you spend the next 10 years investing and spending, saying yes and no the way that planner tells you to, why would you do that? Well, because you trust that he or she knows how to get you where it is you'd like to be. Daniel trusts God in the practical day-to-day -day parts of his life. That is what it means for Daniel to have faith. He doesn't just believe in God generically. He believes in a God who knows what's best. The second way you see this kind of faith from Daniel, this trust in God, is how he feels about God's promises in his prayer life. When they criminalize prayer for 30 days, Daniel goes home and he does what he always does. He prays three times a day. But I want you to notice how he prays. He goes to the window that's open and he faces Jerusalem. Three times a day, he prays to God facing the city of Jerusalem. Now that's interesting because nowhere in the Bible are we told we have to pray a certain amount of times a day or that we have to face a geographic direction when we pray. Why is Daniel praying three times a day facing Jerusalem? Well, the answer to that is that Daniel is an Israelite who does not live in Israel. He lives in Persia. Israel has been laid waste. They are in exile. They've been subjugated by the Persians. And yet Daniel knows that God has made promises to Israel that long ago, God told a man named Abraham that he was going to make Israel into this great family, this great nation, through whom all the nations of the earth would be blessed. And so three times a day, Daniel not, isn't just praying, he's facing the city of God, and he's saying, God, I might live in Persia, and it may look like your promises have been broken, but I'm praying to remind myself that you keep your promises. I'm praying in Persia, but one day your people will be back where you said they would be. I trust your promises. The theologian John Calvin said this great line. He said, prayer changes us more than it changes God. And that's what Daniel's saying. He's saying, God, I know you're going to keep your promises. I know you haven't changed. I know you still have a plan. I'm praying to remind myself that where I'm at today is not where I'm going to be because you always keep your promises. I trust you. And then, of course, finally, Daniel trusts God in the problems of his life. You know, they change the law. They make it illegal to pray. They say, if you pray to anyone other than the king over the next 30 days, you're going to be thrown into the den of lions. And Daniel never wavers. In fact, the writer makes sure that we know that Daniel isn't praying unaware of the law. When he knows the law has been signed, he goes home and he prays, knowing he's breaking the law, knowing this is going to result in him being thrown in with the lions. But he trusts God, not just practically in his everyday life, not just by believing his promises, but he trusts God in the problems of his life. He never rages against the injustice of the law. He doesn't call his attorney. He doesn't look for a way out of it. He trusts that the God that he believes in will carry him through the experience of the lion's den. Daniel has a man of faith, but what that really means is he trusts God. This is what the writer of Hebrews is saying when he defines faith this way. In the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 1, look at the definition that the Bible offers us of faith. Here's what it says, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, 
the conviction of things not seen. How can you have assurance of what you're hoping for? How can you have conviction of what you can't see? The answer to that is trust. When your financial planner tells you, if you do this with your money, you will be where you need to be, you can't see that. You can't know that. Your level of obedience to that is going to be based on your assurance and conviction based on your trust in that person. If I told you, hey, tonight I'm going to come pick you up and take you to dinner at 7 o'clock, that'd be good news for some of you. I'm sure terrifying news for others. But if I said, hey, I'm coming at 7 o'clock to pick you up, at 6 o'clock you would start getting ready. Why? I'm not there. But because you trust me. So when the Bible talks about faith, it is not speaking of believing in things you don't know. Trust is entirely based on what you do know. Trust is always based on data. It's not based on guessing or hoping or wishing. But it's also not speaking of a set of high principles that have nothing to do with your day-to-day -day life. This is how God defines faith. Do you trust me? In big ways, in little ways, do you trust me? So my question is, do you? Do you trust God? Not just by saying you believe that there's a God or that you believe there's a guy named Jesus or you believe this book is true and about him, but in your career, with your money, with your family, with your sex life, with your recreational life, in every area, do you trust God? Because that's what the Bible says it means to have faith. And I especially want you to hear me say that if you're here and you're young. Because I want to spare you from a life that so many of us have experienced, which is a life of calling yourself a believer in God and yet living in a way that is not trusting him. Do you trust God? That's what it means to have faith. That leads me to my second point then, which is to say, well, why does that matter so much? Why does it matter so much if I trust God? Well, of course, in this story, it's everything. I mean, this is the whole story. This is a different story if Daniel hears that they've criminalized prayer and he says, well, for the next 30 days, I'm not going to pray. I mean, this story reads differently, doesn't it? I mean, it matters, but why does it matter? Well, two reasons. The first is that I want you to understand it is intensely personal to God that you trust him. It matters to God that you trust him. That's why this story is in the Bible. Look at this guy who trusted me. Look at how I came through. I want you to trust me as well. That's what God is saying. By the way, the writer of Hebrews knows that. Five verses after he defines faith the way he defines it, this is what he says in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6. Listen to this. And without faith, we might add trust, Without faith, without trust, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. In other words, they must trust that he exists and that he's trustworthy. Listen to what the writer is saying. You cannot please God if you don't trust him. It matters to God that you trust him. This is why, by the way, your fundamental concern and mine is not how you think about yourself or, or how you think about other people or how other people think about you. Your most fundamental concern is how God thinks about you. It matters to God whether or not you trust him. You see, God doesn't look at your financial life or your career or your family or any other corner of your life and see you as just being disobedient, see you as just breaking a rule. God looks at those corners of your life and says, why don't you trust me? What is it about me that you find to be untrustworthy? It matters to God. You cannot please God unless you trust him. And by the way, you know this. Has anyone ever not trusted you? Have you ever had someone believe you to be untrustworthy when you know you are? And what do you find yourself saying? How can you say that to me? How can you ask me that? Why don't you believe me? What have I ever done that would cause you to disbelieve me? You are indignant. You are wounded. You are offended. And so is God. God desires to be trusted. When we trust God, we are saying something about him. When we don't trust him, we are saying something about him. 
But the second reason it matters is because we're not just saying something about him. We're saying something about him to other people. The king in this story is my favorite character. And when the king finds out that the whole scheme behind the lying about, about making it illegal to pray and the whole thing is just designed to get Daniel, he's distraught. He likes Daniel. And I don't think it's because they were buddies. I think it's because Daniel made him a lot of money. Daniel protected his kingdom. He's, he's concerned. He doesn't want to lose Daniel. And so if you read the story, he spends the whole day as the king trying to get Daniel out of it. He's looking for some angle, some legal recourse. And finally, when he can't find a way out of it, as they take Daniel and go to throw him in the lion's den, the king says, Daniel, may your God take care of you. In other words, what he's saying is, may your God do for you what I could not do for you. May your God prove to be trustworthy. And then after spending a sleepless night tossing and turning, he rushes to the lion's den and look at what he says. Did your God show up? Is your God trustworthy? You see, Daniel trusting God isn't just important because God wants Daniel to find him trustworthy. It's also important because when Daniel trusts God, his life becomes a display of God's trustworthiness. It becomes a display of God's glory. Daniel has put himself in a position where God can bring about his good, Daniel's good, and his God's glory. Listen, Christian. When you and I trust God in practical obedience, when we trust him by praying his promises, when we trust him in the problems of our lives, we're not just saying something about him. God, I find you trustworthy. God, I, I love you. I trust you. I believe you. You're wise. You're just. We are also saying to those around us, watch. Watch what happens when you trust God. Watch how he provides. Watch how he takes care of you. Watch how he delivers. And when we don't trust God, we are also saying something about him. Listen, is it any wonder that in our culture, people find our relationship with God to be completely and utterly irrelevant to them? Because while we say we believe in a God who is wise, we believe in a God who is just. We believe a God who is loving. As we say to them, God couldn't love you more. He couldn't love you less. God is so loving and just and wise. He's the absolute last person we listen to in the practical areas of our lives. And people say, "How you must not really believe that he's wise. You must not really believe he's loving. You must not really believe he's kind because you don't listen to him. Daniel's life becomes a display of the trustworthiness of God. That is what your life is meant to be. Well, if you're like me, you're probably saying, well, that might be where I'm supposed to be, but how do I get there? I got to be honest with you, when I read this story, I do not identify with Daniel in this story. There are a lot of reasons for that. I mean, the first reason is that when they follow him around, they cannot find any dirt on him. All they say is the only way to get him is to make it illegal to be, dis to be obedient to God. And I think, boy, you wouldn't have to follow me around for an hour before you'd be like, we have it. We've got him. And then when the king shows up in the morning and says, Daniel, did your God save you? Daniel says, he did, because after all, I'm blameless. And I think, boy, if that factored into the equation, those lines would have gotten me in half a second. I don't feel like Daniel at all. I'm not a guy who, if you want to catch me, you have to make obedience to God criminal. I'm not blameless. I'm not like Daniel. And so here's my question. How do I go from where I am right now, not trusting God, not believing his promises, not trusting him to face the problems of my life? How do I go from where I am now to where Daniel is? And that's my third point. How do you grow faith? How do you grow it? Well, how do you grow trust? How do you grow trust? Well, I think there's an obvious answer to that. You find a track record, a reason to trust. H have you ever gone to a city that you've not been from and you're going to get dinner? What, what do you do? Do you walk out of the hotel, just start walking down the street and say, first restaurant we come to, we're eating there. 
Absolutely not. What do you do? You go on Yelp, you go on Google reviews, you type in restaurants, and you're looking for the restaurant that gets the best reviews. Why? Because you're saying, I haven't eaten there, but somebody has. And if I find a group of people who say to me, we have eaten there and it is great, then I can trust that restaurant. I need someone to go first in order to have a track record. This is what kids do all the time. I think about two brothers in a treehouse getting ready to go down a zip line. I'm the oldest of four, so I've lived this experience. And the younger brother's shaking and shaking. He doesn't want to go down. And the older brother says, you won't die. Come on. Oh, I can't. I'm scared. So what does the older brother do? He grabs the handlebars and he zips down the zip line. And when he makes it to the end, he turns around and he looks back and he says, see, see, you won't die. It's a lot of fun. We need someone to go first. And when I look at this story, it's not Daniel I resonate with, it's the king. Because after all, the king looks for a way to manage this problem on his own. He can't find it. He can't find a way out of Daniel's predicament. And so he goes to Daniel and he says, may God do for you what I can't do for you. And then he spends all night not trusting, but tossing and turning and feeling anxious. I've been there. And then he gets up the next morning and he goes to the lion's den and he says, Daniel, did it work? Did God save you? Here's what he's really saying. Is God trustworthy? And when he finds Daniel alive, look at what he says in the very end of the story. Look at how the king's changed. Look at how faith has grown. Verse 27, this is what he says of God. This is not Daniel, this is the king. And he says, he delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. How do I know that? Here's how. He who has saved Daniel from the power of lions. See, the king is saying, he's saying, I trust this God. Why? Because Daniel went first. Friends, that's what we need. If we were gonna trust God into every corner of our lives, if we were gonna trust his plan and his promises, if we were gonna trust him in the problems of our lives, we would need someone to go first. Don't you see we have that? Not in Daniel, but in Jesus. Jesus who came and lived a life of practical obedience to God, trusting God in every area of his life, doing every element of life God's way. And then what kind of life did he lead? Not, he led the most beautiful, compelling life anyone has ever led. He came trusting God's promises, so much so that the night he was arrested, he said to God, not what I want, but what you want, God, I trust God. You. He came trusting God in his problems, not in a den of lions, but on the cross, dying, saying, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. In other words, I trust you. And in that moment, we find ourselves saying, is he trustworthy? Three days in the tomb, we stand outside the tomb, tossing and turning. Can you trust God? Is God trustworthy? Should you trust him? And when Jesus raises from the dead and we say, Jesus, did it work? Did your God save you? And Jesus says, yes. Then we say, God, now I know I can trust you. Friends, do you see how great the love of God is for you? That what matters most to him is that you trust him. And yet he did not wait for you to whip that up in you, for you to force yourself, push yourself to trust him. But rather, he came and he lived in your place and he died in your place and he rose from the dead saying to you, I know how hard it is for you to trust me. Let me show you how trustworthy I am. You can trust him. How do you know? Because of Jesus because Jesus is the Yelp review, because Jesus is the older brother that goes down the zip line, because Jesus goes first. Friends, do you see that a God who loves you that much is a God who is not out to ruin your career? He's not out to ruin your family. He's not out to ruin your finances. He's not out to ruin your sex life. He doesn't wanna limit you. He wants to bless you. Do you trust him? Will you trust him in light of the track record he's given you in Jesus? I was going over my sermon this morning in my house and my four-year-old son, Graham, was up. He was getting ready to eat breakfast. He has this buffet breakfast in front of him. He's convinced when he grows up, he's gonna be a football player and so he knows he needs to eat a lot. So he's got this big breakfast and he's gonna pray before he eats. And he starts his prayer and I'm listening because I'm dad and I'm a pastor and I'm wanting to make sure, you know, everything's kosher. And so he prays, he says, Jesus, thank you for my food. That's good, check. 
Jesus, thank you for everything else you've given us. And then he says this, I can't wait to see what you do next. Amen. Friends, you know what that is? That's trusting God. What about you? What about you? Do you trust him? Do you trust him? Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much that you are trustworthy. I know as a guy who gets up on stage and tells people to trust you, what an amazing thing it is to, to believe that. You, you actually are worth trusting. You have won that. You have proven that. You have displayed that in Christ. What a pleasure and privilege it is to trust you. Holy Spirit, would you help us get there? Would you convict those of us who are Christians, who know there are corners of our lives we're not trusting you in? Would you show us how that is personally offensive to you? Would you overwhelm us with the goodness of Jesus to win our trust? But especially for those who are here and have never trusted you, would you show them that you have given them in Jesus a reason? In his name we pray, amen.